I thought to mesh together John chapter 8 and Genesis chapter 42 for two reasons. The eighth chapter of John speaks to us about a woman caught in adultery and how Jesus condemned her accusers. And Genesis chapter 42 speaks to us about Joseph's brother Reuben struggling with the idea of forgiving himself. The difference in these two accounts is that in one story, Jesus demonstrates the power of forgiveness. And in the other, it paints the picture of how it can be difficult to forgive yourself. I hope that this morning's message helps you because so many of you are struggling with getting over your past or making a mistake when God has forgiven you. I pray that God lifts the shame off of you so that you can get back to life. Be blessed of the Lord while you listen to this message. I'm going to be speaking to you this morning out of the eighth chapter of John's book. But in order to get there, I have to briefly task the story of Joseph, because that story helps me to pick up the pieces of our subject matter along the way. Every time this commentary of Joseph is mentioned as a lecture or even a monologue, almost immediately the magnitude of grace overwhelms me when I find myself transcending beyond any physical space as would any one of us. And nothing is responsible for that but God because his ways and his thoughts are profound. They are as such that the heavens announce his glory. As captivating as that sounds, those words are a lot larger in the person of your life. This is why the psalmist could admit that my times are in your hands. Those words are a confirmation or a testament to our credence or our confidence. Those of you who have faith in God, the core tenet of what we believe is the grace of God. When you communicate this subject over the span of years, the time allotted for existence, let me remind you that it is of the Lord's doing that we are not consumed. His compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Jonathan Edwards penned a remarkable piece about grace that I would like to share. He said, and I quote, grace is but glory begun and glory is but grace perfected. That means that God helps all of us to get there so that when you come to the crosswalk of accomplishment, triumph, ability, victory, and realization, your understanding is not deprived of the rich soil of divinity. After many blessed years of attending God's mighty acts, observing his performance, witnessing the power of healing and restoration, his influential and imposing breakthroughs, and even times when he has proven to be the God who answers by fire, we can all acquiesce to the Lordship of God. If it had not been for the Lord on our side, where would we be? When we take on the etymology of the word grace, you start appreciating the word unmerited favor, the words esteem and gratitude, the words quality and goodwill, the words elegance and virtue. In Christian theology, it means that you are under divine influence or that God makes your life more attractive by adding ornament and color, which means that you and I have only emerged 
because of God. When we realize this phenomenon, we won't have to live with those anxious thoughts that comes from the enemy. Those thoughts that condemn, those thoughts that shame, those thoughts that convict and castigate and discourage, those thoughts that indict, frustrate, and lecture. But in contrast, you will know that your helper is God. And so as we understand grace, it is consequential because everything that happens takes place because of God. It's consequential because it predates history. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. There can be no way of talking about grace and not say anything about forgiveness, which also means that when God deals with us, He no longer relates to us on the basis of our works or our actions. When God relates to us, he doesn't relate to us based on our past. But grace becomes the catalyst for our endurance. Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, he said, Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. This understanding helps us to discern that there are specific interventions that God is responsible for to help us in the course of sanctification and it eradicates any possibilities that your blessings are infused by your own merit. In fact, anytime the world is patterned on our behalf, you have to know that God is in control. Whenever trouble and unseen danger is put asunder, whenever ineligible moments is distracted from what God wants to do in your life, whenever you get what you know you don't deserve, whenever you are forgiven and then restored, whenever you are delivered from the grip of death and inescapable realities of life, that's the leadership of grace and forgiveness operating on the side of God. As a consequence, my life and your life has been impacted and it's exciting because we now have the peace of God. We now have the security of God. We have the saving purpose of God. We have eternal freedom and that same grace that reconciles us to God defines what our relationship with others should be. You see this truth in the model prayer. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespass as we forgive those who trespass against us. But apparently this invocation or this privilege is overlooked in John's Gospel chapter 8 because those who condemned failed to acknowledge the beam in their own eyes. Isn't it amazing that the 8th chapter of John gets more attention for its negative conference than it really deserves. In fact, the eighth chapter of John, in my humble opinion, has been poorly managed by judgmental people or sanctimonious people who obviously frequents moments of this nature to exploit sin. I'm sure many of you listening have experienced that before. People in your life who are quick to point out where you might be struggling as if they don't have issues themselves. But I would like to submit that God is bigger than your mess up. God is bigger than your past. God is bigger than your weaknesses. God is bigger than anything you might be struggling with. 
and it doesn't matter what the situation is, I want you to know that God can fix anything. And to further make the case, writing the words, he who is without sin cast the first stone on the ground. That is tremendous work and it establishes a marvelous truth. But when you consider the Joseph story, and everything that Joseph goes through with his brethren, their meeting point in Genesis chapter 42, couldn't be more rewarding in context because Joseph epitomizes the business of grace in his personal contact with his siblings. By the time of their assemblage and their confluence, years had gone by and grace has kept up with the times. And years later, Joseph's brothers gets to see him again. But what's amazing about this story is that Joseph didn't come seeking revenge or retribution, but he comes with the accomplishment of grace on his life. Because when God changes you, you are not vindictive. When God changes you, you are not sadistic. When God changes you, you are not spiteful and uncouth. In other words, grace will teach you how to have compassion and mercy and empathy. Maybe you can appreciate this proverb. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Let me point this out before I close. Do you not realize that it is possible for you to have received grace or forgiveness and not forgive yourself? Do you not realize that a lot of what we can't get past, God no longer holds to your account? This is why the Joseph story functions well with John chapter 8. Because while the enemy wants to condemn you and berate you and tear you apart and assail you with negative words, here's a change of course. The Bible said that Reuben in Genesis chapter 42 was melancholy. He was heavy hearted about what he and his siblings had done with his brother Joseph. Let me offer you a running commentary for clarity. Joseph is hated by his brothers. Joseph's brothers put him in a pit, sold him into slavery. He's wrongfully accused. He ends up in prison. And from that point forward, Joseph's life was different. And this is the emotion that has decided Reuben's state of mind. But as mentioned in this foregoing chapter, when Joseph finally deals with his brothers, largely through commerce, Reuben's emotional state was not misplaced or hidden from Joseph's view. When Joseph beheld the remorse of Reuben's heart, the Bible said, that Joseph turned away and he wept. And that understanding sets up this next question, which is, why did Joseph weep? Why is Joseph overwhelmed by how his brother is feeling? It's because he realized that Reuben had not forgiven himself. And many of you are in that same place. You are still torn with yesterday's problem. You are still beating yourself up over something you have already asked God to forgive you for. And the point that I want to drive home is this. When you know that God has forgiven you, when you have made peace with God, when you know that you dwell with Christ, you don't have to walk around feeling guilty. Romans 8 and 1 reads, Therefore there is now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, 
who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For those of you who might be struggling to forgive yourself, and maybe the issue has to do with someone throwing things up in your face. If that is your concern, I want to personally say to you that you have nothing to feel guilty about. Because if God has forgiven you, all you need to do is forgive yourself. I hope these words bless you because God has great things in store for you. You be blessed of the Lord is my prayer.